Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. This is Laurie Smith on Blog Talk Radio. Good morning. It is uh, Wednesday morning, 6 o'clock in the morning here in Calgary, Alberta, April the 14th, and I'm happy to be here. This is One Child Abuse Survivor to Another, and we're on for 30 minutes live. It's a live internet streaming radio broadcast from blogtalkradio.com. You can go there. I have my chat room open, and if you'd like to sit in the chat room, you can, and or if you just want to listen to the from the players, that's fine. And we're on. Uh, we're still covering the Survivor to Thriver workbook. It's 115 pages long. We're on page 107, so we've only got about eight pages left. We're right at the end of this workbook, and it's been a great workbook. It's I found it on the um, Adult Survivors of Child Abuse uh, website, ASCA, Adult Survivors of Child Abuse, a Morris Center program. And you can bring this workbook up yourself. Uh, you can go to that website. It's a free workbook for anyone who wants to go through it. And, you know, it's uh, it's awesome. It's a lot of work, and uh, it's it's been great. It's been very uh, sort of helpful to me as a survivor of child abuse to go through the different steps. There's 21 steps, and we're on step 18 today. So that just tells you, like, we've only got three more steps to go, and we're finished with the workbook. And... Um, you can find that at www.ascasupport.org, and that's A-S-C-A-S-U-P-P-O-R-T.org, and you can pull that workbook up yourself and do that on your own time or in a group setting. They actually suggest, you know, they said uh, for people who haven't come very far in their healing, it is really best to do the Safety First Chapter first, which is like thir- almost 34 pages long, and um, Safety First, and they really highly recommend that people who are just starting out in their healing process and their healing journey to make sure that they are safe enough just to do the workbook because the issues surrounding adult survivors uh, issues of if you grew up in an abusive home and you were abused as a child you you know they know how serious it is um and I do too it's such a it can trigger you and so you can cause all kinds of feelings to come uh rushing forward that you really didn't know you felt um, it can cause you to, it can trigger you to have flashbacks and different things. So you really have to be in a safe enough place to do the workbook. And that's why they recommend that you read that safety first chapter first, just to make sure that you're safe enough to even do the workbook. And then if you are, then you can continue on. And we all, you know, as adult survivors of child abuse, we have to know how far along in our healing that we've come, you know, how we can cope, how we, you know, whether we're going to hurt ourselves or someone else. Uh, this is these are very important things to think about and consider before doing this workbook. So I highly recommend that going to that safety first chapter in the workbook and doing that first, and just make sure that you are in a safe enough place before you do the workbook. I actually did the safety first uh, chapter. We did the whole thing on, on uh, Blog Talk Radio here. It's all in the evening shows. If if you want to go back and listen to um, what we were, what I was talking about with this workbook. It's in the evening um, that I did those shows, and you can uh, pick a, pick them out, right? Because I didn't do hardly any in the morning. I just changed it around just recently to do the morning, uh, to, to start in the morning, because I only had 15-minute shows in the morning, and it just wasn't long enough. So um, I changed the shows to 30 minutes, and now we're doing um, the adult survivor issue stuff on this blog talk radio show instead of the other one, because I just think it's more appropriate. Um and it just seems like it'll work better. So you can go back and listen to those other ones, or you can just pull the workbook back up yourself and go through it. I, I really think everybody should go through the safety first part first, unless you've really come a long way in your healing and you're okay to do this. So, you know, it's not a professional show, and I don't hold any professional counseling certificates or therapist certificates, and, you know, I don't. Uh, this show is not to replace professional help, for sure. Um, I'm just a survivor of child abuse who I believe that Child abuse is not spoken about enough, except for when we hear these reports on the news and we see, you know, reports in the paper of children who have died at the hands of, par- of parents or caregivers, and uh, that's about all the news that we get. And it's just unfortunate. It's sad that that's all we're hearing about. Uh, we're not hearing about how we're going to stop this thing. We're not hearing about how we're going to make changes to help parents who are having a hard time so that they don't abuse their children or caregivers. Uh, we're not talking about how we're going to get keep our children safe from online uh, sexual predators and other predators who are looking for to get a hold of children. You know, this is such a huge epidemic. It's a serious problem. It's been going on for, well, since time began, and because people can't control themselves and stop abusing their children. So we have to really, we have to 
it's going to be up to us to find a way to do this. You know, it's it's going to have to happen. And the, the, the stuff that's in place now, you know, I mean, it's a good thing that we have it because there's so many countries that don't have uh, child protection, child protective services. Actually, most of the world doesn't. But North America, you know, we have some, some great, organizations to, who, who are working to try to help children and get children out of abusive homes. But the problem being is it's not a perfect system, and they really still have not found, you know, good ways of handling this. I mean, our family, we had an intervention done in our family, and I really believe we should have been removed from the home. Um, I was really young. I was just a toddler, but looking back on it, I'm thinking, we, you know, well, we definitely re- needed to be removed from the home until my parents could prove that they actually went and got the counseling and the help they needed. Uh, and then we could have been brought back into the home after the courts had seen that they actually had done the work that they were supposed to do. And then I think we should have had one or two years of supervision so that uh, our parents would have had to prove that they could look after us properly and not abuse us, right? So that's just the whole issue. It's a serious problem. We know what's going on, and it really has to stop. So that's why I'm doing this show. And, um, you know, just to be one more voice out there, just to say we have to stop child abuse, and just another voice to say, you know, if you're a survivor of child abuse, you're not alone. Sad enough to say, be great if it was just one of us, just me. And, and you know what I mean? Uh, it's unfortunate there are so many of us, but it, 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 it's... You know, you're not alone. You did not deserve to be abused. And uh, that's. I just want to be another voice to let people know that they can do it, they can make it, but you have to reach out and get help. You have to reach out where you can, and get the help where you can find it, where where it's comfortable for you. You know, whether it's a therapist, a counselor, uh, a group support. I really like group support, and I really like the idea of online group support because, you know, when you're having a bad day and stuff, these people in these groups, you know, they understand because they've been there. And even if they haven't experienced the same exact things that, that you have or you haven't experienced quite what they have, they're in their healing journey. And so they really want people to make it. And so I really like group support and, and online group supports for, for adult survivors of child abuse because people are w- really supportive. And they know what it's like to be in this kind of pain and misery that that this these issues bring upon us, you know. So um, just keep reaching out. That's what I say. So, yeah, if you're a young person under the age of 18, please, you know, have someone listen to the show with you. I really fight for child rights. I fight for child safety. I fight for online child safety. And I'm telling you, there's so many psychos out there trying to get a hold of children online. You want to let your parents know if you have a parent who cares, which I really pray and hope that you do. If you don't, you want to let a teacher know, counselor, someone who you trust and seems to be interested in what you're doing. Let them know what you're doing online. And, you know, if you want to listen to this show, that's great. But it is really quite mature material. It's really meant, uh, it's meant, you know, to stop child abuse and protect children. But some of the material is very adult-oriented. And so I think that you should have uh, someone who knows what you're listening to and then they can listen to this with you and then they can help you if you have questions and whatnot and they can also let you know if you should really be listening to it or not. So it's really important to keep yourself safe because you could save your life. If you tell your friends about that kind of stuff, you can save your own, you can save your friends' lives. You know, it's so important. You have to keep yourself safe. And so online safety is number one. You have to be really, really careful. So um, yeah, we'll get right on with the show. Listen at your own discretion, everyone. If if the subjects of abuse bother you and, and the topics bother you, you have to turn the show off. It's your discretion. And so just make sure that you're safe enough and, and okay enough to be listening to this show, okay? And because safety is like number one. So we're going to get right on with it. And uh, we have about 20 minutes left. We're looking at step 18 of the Survivor to Thriver workbook, page 107. You can go there and pull it up. It's a great workbook. And... Um, like I said, this is the end of the workbook. So, you know, most, uh, they, they, the ASCA, I'm sure by now, they said, if you've gotten to the step 18, you know, you're pretty much through your healing process. So if you're just starting out in your healing process, you might not want to listen to the show, and you might want to just go to pull up that workbook at uh, www.ascasupport.org and pull up the Survivor to Survivor workbook. It's free. And just take a, start, at, start at step one or chapter one, which is safety first. I think that's such a, such a good idea because you can always come back and listen to my shows when you're feeling more safe about it and you're feeling like you can handle the emotions that might come with it and uh, that you're not going to hurt yourself or someone else, right? So important. So we'll get right on. Step 18. Step 18 is really quite interesting. It's really, uh, for me, I find that it's probably um, where I would actually have to be working you know, because I haven't quite come all the way through. <laughs> and step 18 seems to be where I need to actually do a little bit of work on it. I have done some, and I'll read it here. I have resolved the abuse with my offenders to the extent that it, it is 
acceptable to me. Okay, I'll read it over. I have resolved the abuse with my offenders to the extent that is acceptable to me. That's step 18. So, you know, this is really, for a lot of us, you know, sometimes they go on to talk about it, that, you know, we can't resolve uh, the issues with our offenders and our abusers, but they, they, they go on to describe this. So we'll start reading right at the top of this article here. It says, this step involves making a decision about resolving the issues left over from your childhood abuse with those who abused you and or failed to protect you, your parents or abusers. The important task in this step is to resolve the abuse with your family in a way that is acceptable to you. You have the right to choose how to do this. It is not mandatory to confront your parents, family, or abusers, although many survivors find confrontation valuable. However, you may want to maintain a relationship with your parents' abusers without hiding your recovery efforts or denying your new identity as a, as a recovered survivor. You probably um, will need to do something, they said here. And if there is to be a continuing relationship, your parents' abusers will need to accept you as you now desire to be accepted with respect consideration and acknowledgement of the burdens you have overcome and uh, you know really um, a lot of times we people don't often change you know I mean uh, my mother right up until the day she was third you know until until I was 30 and and she was passing away you know she had never really changed and never apologized or said she was sorry for the way that she treated me and um, I seriously doubt there would have ever been any uh, res you know like anything resolved there um, even though I know in her heart she loved us, she she was uh, she was abused as a child. She had a lot of emotional problems. She had a, she might have had some mental instability. I don't know. She was diagnosed um, manic depressive, and she was abused as a child, just treated horribly. And then she was in a marriage that she was just miserable in, and she had a bunch of kids that she did not know how to parent. And so she had a lot of anger issues. She had a lot of uh, she had a lot of violence and. Uh, um, she was very kind of vicious, you know, and she was just very hateful because she hated her life. And so because she hated her life, it spilled on to us, and she actually would tell us quite often that she hated us. And, um, you know, her abuse just, you know, shaped us to be who we are, you know. And she never really changed. Um, she mellowed out when she got old. And uh, just before she passed away, she said, I, I've been a horrible mother, but she never did apologize. I think that was about the only way that she could apologize. But she said that to me on her deathbed, really. And um, But she never said, you know, I'm sorry for the way I treated you. You were my special girl or, you know, I loved you or anything like that, right? So, uh, I know that she did. But the thing is, is when you're growing up and you're, you know, you're just a small kid, you need that love and nurturing. And I never got that. So I would have never been able to get that. And I... It's a shame. It's unfortunate, but she could never give that to me, right? And so, and with my dad, he's a manic. He's not manic. He's a. I don't know if he's manic depressive, but he's a borderline schizophrenic. So you know, he he's admitted to the abuse actually, and he's admitted to the fact that he did a lot of terrible things to his family and his wife. But he really kind of expects that everybody should just continue to take his abusive behavior now that he's 86, and uh, which I refuse to do. So uh, he knows quite well that I'm not putting up with any of his abusive behavior. And, um, but he doesn't care what he's at. He doesn't care that you know, two of my brothers are dead uh, you know, and went to their graves. One died of a drug overdose in a shelter in Calgary. And another one committed suicide at the age of 33 here in Calgary as well. And he just doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't associate his behavior with that. He thinks that it, it had nothing to do with him. And so he doesn't take any responsibility for anything that happened to the family, even though he apologizes for it. But he's schizophrenic, so he doesn't think properly. He doesn't have, he doesn't understand what he did, right? And so, because he's schizophrenic, people often are not in touch with reality. And he's often, quite often, not in touch with reality. So it's a shame, but uh, I just don't take any abuse off him, that's all. And so it's quite interesting. I, I'm, you know... I'm going to have to be comfortable with the, the situation because it's not going to change. But we'll go on and read the rest of this. It says, you must remember that because you are dealing with people who may have never faced or changed their own abusive behavior, the degree of resolution will depend on the extent to which they can acknowledge the abuse. For this reason, there is a wide range of possible resolutions which ultimately will uh, will determine whether you can still have some kind of relationship with your parents, abusers. If you decide to confront them, it is critical that you go into it fully prepared for whatever responses or consequences follow. 
If they do not want to hear your experience or accept the person you are becoming, then you must face the question of whether ongoing contact will be healthy for you. And that's just huge, right? Um, you know, if they're not, like my family, I, I went public with my story as a blog about, well, last October, November, and I decided to go public with my story just as a blog on Blogger and uh, because I needed to get it out because it was just kind of eating at me and killing me. And I didn't want to go to my grave with this uh, pain in my heart, you know, and I thought, no, I'm going to just speak the truth and I don't care who likes it because as far as my family goes because people need to know the truth about abuse and survivors need to know that they're not alone and that their voice deserves to be heard and uh, that they didn't deserve to be abused, right? So I thought, okay, I'm going public with my story because I'm going to, I'd like to get involved. I, I, I'm the Canada Regional Director for Dreamcatchers for Abused Children and I'd like to go out and do public speaking on behalf of child abuse victims and survivors and on the behalf of dream catchers for abused children to stop child abuse, right? So I thought, well, I'm going to have to go public because if I'm going to go do public speaking, I can't stand up there and just, if someone says, have you ever experienced child abuse? Or have you been abused as a child? I'm not going to lie and say no. I thought, no, I need to be honest about this, get this out in the open eye, out in the public, you know, and, and I don't mind, and that's great. But the thing is, I, I did take a good look at the situation and think about what it would do to my family, the, the remaining members, which there's only a few of us left, um, if I did go public. And I thought about it. I thought, well, they're not really in my lives anyway. I mean, they're not in my life. They don't support me um, as far as my healing journey goes. Uh, one of my brothers actually has been ignoring me for the last three years. And another sister is there for me, but she will not acknowledge the abuse that happened to me. She'll acknowledge kind of what was going on in the family, but she will not acknowledge that she was there and she saw the abuse because she was there. Um, so it's unfortunate. I think maybe she had blocked it or something. She might have blocked it out. It was very horrific. So I'm just thinking that um, it's possibly that, you know, uh, if I lost my family because I went public, uh, for the remaining members, I didn't care because I've been on my own for so long anyway. With family, I've been on my own. So our family was never a family. So I'm used to actually not having that family, that closeness, you know. So people would, you know, a lot of times, you know, you have to think about what these situations will do and that it could really, you know, have a, an effect on your life. So before you go and do anything, you want to make sure that you're comfortable with the outcomes. And I really went through what could be the possible outcomes and what could be the worst outcome. And I thought, no, truth is truth. And I'm willing to back it up because truth is truth. And... um I, I really have to go with what I believe in my heart, and that is that truth needs to be told in every circumstance. So if we're going to ever stop child abuse, the issue it has to be it has to stop being pushed under the carpet, like I always say. It has to stop uh, being locked away in a closet and just forgotten about. Truth is truth, and it hurts. But kids are being abused. Children are losing their lives at the hands of caregivers and parents, especially little babies. Um, it's just horrific. Start looking around in the paper and check it out. You know, it's got to stop. So if it, if we don't have truth, we don't have anything, right? So because parent abusers hide behind lies all the time and blame other people for their for for what they've done. And so truth is truth and too bad if it hurts. And so I was willing to lose my, the rest of my family members over this. So now then my book was published, uh Donna Shear, best-selling author and president of Dream Catchers for Abused Children on my blog and said that I should publish my book. So I've gone ahead and done that. And uh, with her help, and uh, thank, thanks be to them for doing this, uh, I have a book, and it's called A Life of Death, The Redemption. And you can find it on Lulu. It'll soon be at Barnes & Noble and Amazon. And uh, you can get a hold of me if you want a copy. You can also get purchase a copy off of uh, blogtalkradio.com. I have a little link there on my page. You can scroll down to the bottom, and it's there if you want to get a copy. Uh, all proceeds are going to Dreamcatchers for Abused Children. Every single dime of, of sales is going to Dreamcatchers for Abused Children. Reason being, I don't want money for that book. Uh, I wrote that story to uh, be a voice for my two brothers that went to their graves in silence and shame. I also wrote it to be to free myself from the from the chains and misery of, of keeping this whole thing silent and just pretending that it never happened. And I wrote this book for other survivors, you know, so that they'll know that there's hope, you know, and to keep going and, and that we deserve to be have a good life we deserve to treat ourselves well we deserve to treat to be treated well right and we deserve to have a good life so there was many reasons i wrote that story 
And um, I hope you'll pick it up. And all the proceeds are going to help stop child abuse, which is what I really want. And so it makes me happy. And so some of my, I think, you know, a couple of my family members have seen it. They're not, they have never talked to me about it. I think that they don't know what to say. You know what I mean? And um, that's just unfortunate for them. If they can't hurt me, they don't need to be in my life, period. Because I have uh, come that far in my healing that I can just say, look, if you're just going to continue abusing me by treating me with, you know, disregard and, and, dis and, and no respect, you have no business in my life. You know, I don't take abuse from anyone now, and especially from my family, right? No way. From any family member. I just refuse. So, you know, if they go away, they go away. I don't care, right? It's just, that's, but I'm okay with that. So you have to be really careful when you decide if you're going to confront people or, um, you know, you have to sit down and almost go through the steps of what's the worst case scenario different things that might happen because of it. And because you, you want to be safe and you don't want to regress in your healing. So you want to be very careful. And I'll continue reading here. It says, this step presents the big issue of whether to forgive your parents' abusers. In a sense, resolving the abuse means coming to terms with, with what, has, uh, what was done to you and accepting the feelings you have toward the people that did it. For some people, this means forgiveness, but not necessarily for you. Those who were very sadistically and severely abused may never be able to forgive their parents' abusers. Accepting that the abuse occurred and putting it all behind you once and for all may be the only resolution that makes sense and feels right. Deciding whether to forgive or accept is your choice and no one else's. And that's very true. Um, you know, I mean, I, I made a very conscious decision to forgive everyone who's ever done anything wrong to, wrong to me in my lifetime because I would like to be forgiven for the things that I've done wrong to people. And I thought, you know, if I want to be forgiven, I certainly need to forgive. But I don't condone what they did. And so there's two very different steps to that for me. Um, you know, I forgive, I forgive them. I really do. But I don't condone what they did at all. I don't condone what any abuser does. And I don't condone abuse of any kind. And so therefore, you know, I guess there was two parts to my forgiveness. Uh, one is so that I can feel good in my heart that, you know, that I'm able to do that because I'm the bigger person. And also because, uh, you know, I want to be forgiven for terrible things that I've done to people in my lifetime, you know what I mean? And so, um, but also the fact that I don't condone abuse of any kind, so I don't condone what they did. And so therefore, I just kind of have to accept that and trying to move past it, right? And so that's what that, that this actual uh, Step 18 was about. They have self-help here, uh, suggestions from the ASCA, and also professional help suggestions from them. And they, they list off these things here. We'll just go through them. Number one, review the section in Chapter 1. What about confronting my abuser or abusers? Although far from a complete discussion, it highlights some of the complicated issues involved in answering the questions. And number two, write some letters to your parents' abusers in your journal and then reread them a few weeks later. This will help you to develop your sense of what you may someday want to say to them. These letters are a working statement of your message to your parents' abusers, and they may evolve over time until such time as you decide whether to confront them. I think that's a great idea, to write these letters and not send them, but just keep looking at them, keep rereading them periodically, right? And then you can add to it or change it uh, depending on how you're feeling. And then, you know, you may get to be to a point where one day you'll just be like, okay, this is the letter I'm going to send. This is what I want to say. This is what needs to be said. And then you can send that letter, right? And um, it'll be just exactly what you really need for them to hear. And I think that's awesome. And they do say for coping mechanisms, if you're just struggling with this, you can write letters to your parents and abusers, tell them exactly how you feel. If you don't, if you can't send them because your parents are, you know, you're not in contact with them, or let's say the abusers, uh, you know, they've passed on or something, you can write these letters anyway and then tear them up or keep them, whatever you want to do. But it does help to actually get it out on paper. It really does. It's a release for these emotions and feelings that we're having. And that, and really, to, it's, it's so important to be able to voice what happened to us. It's, so it's very important to be able to voice it without hurting ourselves or someone else, right? Because uh, we, have to, we have to make sure that we're not hurting ourselves and that we can stay safe, right? So they did say that that's a good way to do it is to write, you know, write letters. And whether you send them or not, it does allow this stuff to come out and be put on paper so that you can look at it. And uh, then it's no longer necessarily stuck inside of you. It's out on paper. And then you can make the decision after carefully thinking about it 
what you're going to do with the letters, right? So important. Number three, if you are having uh, difficulty deciding whether to confront, try to answer some of the following questions in your journal. What past attempts, if any, have you made to address the abuse and how did they turn out? What are your reasons and motivations for confronting your parents or abusers? And what do you hope to get out of it? How do you want your parents and abusers to react to you? And how do you imagine they will react to you? Is there a specific outcome that would make you regret your decision to confront your parents or abusers? That's the big one. So is there something that you know would happen that would make you regret your decision to confront your uh, parents or abusers? Because we have to think about all of the different cases, scenarios, because it could not, it might not go the way that we want it to, and then we might be devastated because it didn't go the way we wanted it to. If we were thinking that our parents were going to, you know, or abusers were going to say, oh, you know, fall on their knees and, uh, you know, really beg forgiveness and, and, and say, I, I'm so sorry I did that, but it seemed, that might not happen, you know. Or if, if even if we were thinking that our abusers or our parents were going to um, just acknowledge the abuse, a lot of times that won't happen. And so we have to be sort of aware of how we're going to feel if after we do confront them and so that we don't set ourselves up for a fall, right? So we don't want to fall back into and regress in our healing. So this is the whole thing. You want to be very cautious about this step, I really think, and um, just make sure that you know exactly how you're going to feel with each thing that could happen from confronting them and go through and, and make sure that you're okay with the with the outcomes of each one of those because it's so important. But here's their professional help uh, recommendations. Confronting your parents' abusers is an, an issue that will require the committed involvement of your therapist in helping you sort out what you want to do and how you want to do it. Planning any kind of confrontation about the abuse, be it a meeting or simple discussion with your parents' abusers, will benefit from a full and complete airing of feelings, doubts, expectations, and hopes. You will need the outside perspective of your therapist to make the best decision. So I think that's a good idea. If you have a counselor or therapist, we can walk through it with them, right? If you wrote down answers to the questions posed in self-help item number three in your journal, discuss them with your therapist. Together you may be able to reach a conclusion based on your writings, doubts, feelings, hopes, and expectations. And number two here, they said, sometimes it is helpful to invite your parents, family, or abusers into your individual therapy for a session or more to discuss and work out selected conflicts with the help of your therapist. This would temporarily change the format and focus of your individual therapy, although you and your therapist would already have an established alliance. You should be aware, though, that family therapy is not necessarily advisable or possible given varying circumstances and attitudes of the persons involved. Adding your parents, family, or abusers to your therapy sessions would pose an ethical conflict for your therapist, at least initially. Obviously, any consideration of such a plan must stem from your desire for it and your belief that it would be pro productive. Your therapist would also have to agree that the benefits of such an arrangement would out outweigh the possible detriment. So there would have to be more benefit benefits to it than more bad stuff, right? And if family therapy is your goal, then you will need to do a lot of preliminary planning as to what you want to say, what your goals are, and how you will deal with challenges to your point of view. If more extensive family work is ind indicated, or indicated and or acceptable, you probably would find a separate family therapist who could be more neutral than your individual therapist. In general, therapy of this sort is most likely to be successful when your parents or abusers have done some work on themselves or at least have admitted they have made a mistake. That's very important. And discuss with your therapist what you think and feel that the issue of forgiveness, about the issue of forgiveness. Explore what feels right to you. And you read be aware that feelings about forgiveness, like any other symbol of resolution, may shift over time. So that's very true. And so that's all they had on that chapter. Tomorrow we're going to look at step 19, which is I hold my own meaning about the abuse that releases me from the legacy of the past. This is going to be a good one. So we have about a minute left, and I thank you so much for, for tuning in, and I hope this certainly helps you out, and I know it does help me. Um, um, yeah, like I'm the Canada Regional Director for Dreamcatchers for Abused Children. You can go on their website and check it out. They have some great information http dreamcatchers for abused children dot com it's just a very healing site. I really enjoy going there and looking around and checking it out. There's such good information there. And for people who are not survivors of child abuse, but maybe who support a survivor of child abuse, um, it's a great website to go to because you can get all kinds of information there too. And, you know, we need to become educated and aware on the signs and symptoms of abuse of all the different types of child abuse. And we also need to know how to report it. And if you suspect child abuse, you need to do the right thing. That is to report it because uh, uh, an abused child is not a happy child. You're not going to be breaking up a happy family, let me tell you. 
And so you want to make sure that we are looking. We we want we want to make sure we're looking out for the kids around us in our world. Uh, it's so important because they don't have anyone to stand up for them unless we do. Because many times people are children are abused, and no one will stand up for them. And that's in my case. And I hope you will grab my book, A Life of Death: The Redemption. And um, I, it's a true story. And I hope that you will grab it and check it out because uh, it's just a really good example of what happens when children are left in with, with parents who are abusive and continue to abuse their children, and then the leftover cycle and what happens to them as adults. Because I've really just told the truth about my whole life story and and my family so i hope you will pick it up and um thank you so much for tuning in everybody and for your support you know i've got friends in the uk and friends in australia and uh, in the united states and in canada and all over the place i thank you so much for being here for me because this support has really helped me to be able to do what i'm doing and i and i love you all so much so have a great day everybody take care and we'll we'll talk to you soon i'll be on tonight uh, child abuse prevention, human rights abuse prevention is up to us, and that's at 9.30 Mountain Standard Time here tonight. And until then, take care. Bye-bye.